Welcome to the Writers League of Texas podcast, conversations and presentations featuring writers and industry professionals talking about the craft and business of writing. More information about this discussion, including details on our panelists and presenters, can be found at writersleague.org. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Well, so welcome to Third Thursday. So what we do is we talk about the craft and business of publishing. Um, and you're all here because you're trying to start or restart a writing project. That's our topic for tonight. Um, and, and when you're doing that, you're doing it by yourself, like at your desk or you know, wherever you work, um, because being a writer is in part a solo endeavor, but it's also um, like being a writer is, is a community thing as well. And the reason that people seek out MFA programs and writing groups and writing retreats and residencies is so that you can be part of a writing community. And a big part of that means talking about craft. Um, not because there's any sort of like one secret that you're going to learn about craft because there, there's no right answer. But when you talk to smart people like we've got up here, you're, you're liable to hear some things that you might not have thought before or things that you have thought before, but you forgot and now you're reminded or just phrased differently so that you like think about them in a different way. And so we're going to talk tonight about strategies for just getting started and keeping going because getting started is only half the battle. You got to like, you know, write on day two and day three and day four and so on. Um, so welcome. I'm going to get straight to introducing our panelists. To my left is Jardine LeBaire. Her most recent novel, White Fur, was chosen as a Barnes & Noble Discover selection, an Amazon Best Book, and a Book of the Month Club pick. Her first novel, Here Kitty Kitty, will be republished by Hogarth this year. Her television series adaptation of White Fur with Film Nation Entertainment recently sold to Amazon Studios, where she continues to develop it as the sole writer. Her creative nonfiction collaboration with photographer Phyllis B. Dooney, Gravity is Stronger Here, came out in April 2017. She co-wrote a YA series called The Upper Class under the pen name Carolyn Says, and she volunteers for Truth Be Told, a writing program for incarcerated women in Lockhart, Texas. Please welcome Jardine. Doug Dorse is the author of two novels, the New York Times bestselling S with filmmaker J.J. Abrams and Alive in Necropolis, which was shortlisted for the Penn Hemingway Award, and a story collection, The Surf Guru. He also wrote for the Amazon show Z, The, Be the Beginning of Everything, and co-created the play Monster in the Dark with Fuel's Fury Theater of San Francisco. He lives in Austin and directs the MFA program in creative writing at Texas State University. Please welcome Doug. And Irene Larisova is the author of two poetry collections, Furia and Blood Sugar Canto, which were both finalists for the International Latino Book Award in Poetry, an e-chatbook, Enduring Azucares, as well as a short story collection, Flesh to Bone, which won the Premio Atsalon. She and poet Dan Vera are also the co-editors of Amanaman Poets Writing in the Islands and Duan Borderlands, a collection of poetry and essays. Irene was recently named a 2016-2018 Texas Touring Roster Artist. Please welcome Irene. <laughs> so I, would, I thought we would begin with a, like the simplest and, I don't know, perhaps like hardest question of the night, which is like when you're sitting down for the first time, you've decided, all right, like, this is it. It's a New Year's resolution, and this is the year I'm going to make this happen. And then you sit down, and you're, you're going to face like the blank page, literally, or a blank, you know, screen and the blinking cursor. What do you do? Like, what's like the? F how do you actually start? Because for so many of us, like we have these great ideas. Oh, it's brilliant, and it's in our head. And then you sit down, and you realize that what's in your head and what's on the page are t are totally different. How do you like? Literally, how do you start making those first words? And Jardine, since you're sitting like, next to me, uh, I'll let you start. I think I have a few um, techniques that I go to that kind of rotate in being useful. Um, sometimes they don't work for me, sometimes they do. One is to start any major piece in handwriting. There's something about writing in a notebook and not on a computer and not facing that blank manuscript word doc 
that helps me be a little bit looser and spontaneous and not take it so seriously. Um, and then I'm an outliner, so I usually, by the time I'm ready to sit down and start working, have some sort of a sense of my destination. And then there's a tension to resolve the blank page and the destination. And that usually pulls me along a little bit. And I think the other thing that I constantly repeat to myself when starting something um, is something that I was told once that the first 30 pages of, in this case, a novel, are usually the writer clearing their throat. So <laughs> someone told me to just get those 30 done, because you're going to ax them anyway. But at least you'll be deep in, and you'll have your your tone established, and you'll kind of know where you're going. So those are my three how to start that first day um, tools. Doug and Irene, is that the same process for both of you, or do you do you both handwrite to start with, or do you have different processes? Um, absolutely not. That looks nothing like my process. <laughs> <laughs> um, I well, kind of to to take it back a couple steps. I don't believe in writing things in your head. You know, this whole idea that people have that what you have on the page is never going to match what's on your head. So that's why I just completely do not believe in writing in your head. I mean, yes, in some ways we are working with ideas and symbols and stories and things like that. But really, I think when you think about it, we are writers working with words on a page. So I think the sooner you can get to being a writer working with words on a page, the better. Um, what I do in my head is not, I also I don't believe in outlines. Also, I usually don't know what I'm doing when I sit down and write, and I don't know who the people are, and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so because I, uh, you know, that whole thing about um, who was it that said, you know, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. I like to be surprised constantly. Um, so I set up parameters in my head. I'm like, okay, these, this is the, the kind of problem that I'm going to try to resolve. These are the limitations I'm going to have. This is the situation I'm looking at. These are some major themes I'm looking at. And I have maybe a voice or a line or an image that's haunting me. And that's it. It's time to start. And I just jump in. And so like, there are times when I've written a story and then not realized until afterwards that it wasn't working because someone's not the right age or you know, someone's not in the right place. But you figure these things out and it's so, to me, it's immensely rewarding to have that. So yeah, for me it's just, just get to it. You just get to it. Don't, don't build the fantasy up here because that's never gonna match. But it's also, it's not what you're doing. You know, in any artist, you, you think of a, a, a person that does you know, sculpture or, or painting, you're not playing with what's in your head. You're playing with the actual paint, the actual glass, the actual stone. So as writers, we need to get to the actual word. Doug, we've staked out two <laughs> different ways of approaching it, an outlining and a sort of writing into the dark to the words on the page. Where, where do you fall? Um, I, I'd like to advocate a third way. No, no, that just seemed like the right thing to say. Um, I, I want to go back, actually, to, um, to your setup, you know, that, that you're sitting down. It's 2018. This is the year I'm going to do it. Um, and I think if that works for you, if that gets you motivated and, and gets you, you know, writing fearlessly, awesome. Run with it. There are some people, um, and I would probably count myself among them, who uh, frankly struggle with the critical voice, that sort of terrified, mean-spirited critical voice. And um, one way to, <laughs> the quickest way to give the critical voice um, the, the power position is to say everything's riding on this today, this piece that I'm working on. And um, so I do a lot better if I actually don't take the long view. If I'm like, yep, sitting down today, gonna write some words, we'll see what happens. And, um, and I need that, I need that soft entry um, into something. Uh, another thing that I do, and this is, this is also, it's a, it's something that I learned to do to, to sort of, if not tame the critical voice, at least kind of shuffle it out of the way for a little while. Um, to have two documents open on the screen. And uh, on, you know, left side is what I will actually be writing. And the right side is just whatever junk is in my head. Um, and what I might do is actually set a timer, 15, 20 minutes, where I just have to be typing. I can't think, I can't go back, I just have to, you know, 
keys have to be clacking for 20 minutes. And, and on the right side, it might honestly be 20 minutes of me saying, um, I'm a fraud. This is terrible. <laughs> this is the worst idea I'm ever embarking upon. Oh, by the way, did I say I'm a fraud? I'm a fraud. Um, but the thing is, like, once you actually get started typing and, and kind of, you know, release the pressure over there, it becomes really easy to slide back over to that left document. And more often than not, I don't even realize I'm doing it. And it's just, I'm, I'm there, I'm in word land, I'm typing, and that's, um, that's one way that I can trick myself into getting started. And another is um, just to play games. Um, that, that is, if I don't have a strong sense of an opening line or an opening image, um, you know, when it comes right down to it, it doesn't have to be the right beginning. You're, you're going to revise it no matter what, or at least you really should. Um, so just get something down there. I mean, give yourself permission to write your way into the thing. And if you are doing that, then it's, then it's very easy to say, okay, I'm going to do a first line that has all 26 letters of the alphabet. We'll see what happens. Or, you know, play like little Ulipian games or, um, sorry, that was a little bit of a pretentious reference. Um, but, uh, you know, something like um, pulling a random word out of the dictionary and challenging yourself to get it into that first line. Or, um, I mean, honestly, anything. You know, uh, you can, sometimes I'll start with a rhythm. You know, uh, I, I know I want a first line that starts like da 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 da. You know, well, it would be a better rhythm than that. <laughs> um, and then you find words to match it, and then you keep going. And and you might throw it out. You probably will, but it has fulfilled its purpose of being the beginning of something. You know, Doug, what you were saying about you know not taking the long view, just saying I'm sitting down and writing, that kind of reminded me, Jardine, of what you said, like, well, the first 30 pages are you're just clearing your throat, and so you can't have any expectation that they're going to like be the thing itself because you're wor getting warmed up. But you know, as writers, it is like tempting to take that long view and say, oh, you know, whatever this kind of novel that I'm working on right now, this is hot right now. This is like, boy, this is my time. And I can imagine it'd be tempting to say like, I'm just going to skip those 30 pages. We'll just like, you know, I'm going to get straight to the good stuff. Are there like, are there basically like psychological activities that you have to like give yourself to say, don't try to like jump ahead of where you are? I think free writing, any kind of free associative writing, like what you're talking about. And then also like what you're talking about with going straight to playing with the words themselves helps to kind of circumnavigate the grander, more commercial pressure that you might put on something. So tapping into anything that has to do with play, you know, and games, I love that idea. Um, but I think always a writer is holding those two things side by side that it doesn't matter and it matters more than anything else. Um, and, it, and it always feels like that to me, it feels like two things that I know for sure, they contradict each other, and I live with them while I'm working on this project until it's over, you know? What about in terms of getting into the right frame of mind? So there's, like, there's the sitting down um, and playing games. There's al also, I mean, oftentimes we feel like I'm not in the mindset to write. And I, and I once heard the, the poet Carolyn Forche um, say that she her sense of her own poetry was that she was acting as a kind of uh, medium. And so like it was coming down from above and she was just sort of like, it was passing through her to the page. Um, and, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that introduction for Irene because you're a poet as well. And do you have a sense for like what it takes to get your brain in the right place to, to make those words happen? Do you like do you listen? You know the things that like people do, like they listen to music or they you know put on a candle or you know take a walk. I'm gonna t tackle both of your last questions. Um, one, it, when you know when you're thinking about these other ideas and the longer view. So this is something I rant about all the time. So I'm gonna share that rant with y'all. Um, <laughs> what I tell people in workshops is that there's certain things that you I I would think every writer has to decide what is your job as a writer and what's not your job as a writer. And there's a really long list of stuff that I put under not under my job as a writer. 
So things like people's hurt feelings, not my job. Um, representing all Latinos or all women or all working class people or all whatever, not my job. Um, getting on the bestseller list, not my job. Um, you know, my book having to do this or this or this or that or sell these many numbers or whatever else, also not my job. All of that stuff is not my job. Hmm. My job, and, and I think it's a good idea to at some point define that and, and to continue to, to redefine it over time. My specific job is to write the most difficult thing I can write at any given point in time. My job, um, because I've decided that my purpose as a writer is to speak to different issues that need healing, whether it's personal, communal, or historical trauma, uh, whether it's isolation or pain or illness, whether it's, you know, whatever, whatever I've decided my issues are, to speak to those things. That is my purpose. That is my reason for writing. So everything else is not. Is it my job to try to get my work out there? Yes, it is, you know, because I'm trying to speak to people. I'm trying to communicate with people. I'm trying to share possible scenarios for how to get out of difficult places. Huh? Um, so it's my job to share. It's my job to be out there and promote. It's my job to speak to people, and let, you know, and they're things I love. The commercial aspect of it, probably because I'm a poet and a literary fiction writer, um, it would be nice, but I'm not necessarily tied to that having to be what my writing does. So it's not my job to worry about, are these numbers this great, and am I on this list or that list? Not my job. If that helps a lot with social media when you're looking at Facebook and you see all these people, you're just, okay, it's not my job. Envy, not part of my job. Competition, not part of my job. Community is my job, okay? so. So that, I think, is one of the things that helps with that longer view. You can put too much pressure on a book thinking, well, this novel has to sell, and this novel has to do this, and this novel has to win a Pulitzer, and this novel has to get me tenure, and this novel has to do all of these things. I, uh, you can really hurt a project when you put that much pressure on it. Um, you know, think of a child. If you're raising a child and you're like, well, you're going to be a doctor, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that, let the poor child be whatever the poor child's going to be. Um, so I feel that way about books. You've got to let them be what they're going to be and live the way that they're going to live. Um, and I'm sorry, second question. You said poetry, getting into the place. Oh, yeah, how do you get <laughs> All right, so <laughs> this is the other subject that I'd like to rant about a lot, too. And that's because I, um, at the moment, am working seven days a week. So I have a full-time job, bread and butter, Monday through Friday, and then I'm working eight hours a day, Saturday and Sunday. Um, I also have a brother who's in a wheelchair that I'm a caregiver, the only caregiver for. Uh, and I myself have been an insulin-dependent diabetic for 10 years. So um, as you can imagine, I am very busy. Um, and I do not have a lot of time. Um, I prefer to sleep, so I'm not one of these people that's going to get up two hours early every morning. Um, I seriously do not have time to you know, meditate for an hour or do some kind of ritual or figure out what I'm going to do. Like I, I don't have time for this. Um, that does mean that sometimes I will go you know, days, weeks, or months without writing. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to write a whole shelf worth of books, you know? Um, and I was thinking about this in, in preparation for this, and I thought, you know, I don't give myself enough credit for being organized. Um, everywhere I go, and I don't care if I am at work or if I'm at the HEB, you know, grocery line store or whatever, I always carry with me poems that are in progress, stories that are in progress, and usually a chapter that's in progress. I always have my composition notebook with me. Um, if I'm at home, I now, you know, once I crossed the 40s, my memory was just shot. <laughs> <laughs> so I've organized things so that I remember them. So on the side of one of, of my bed, on one side, there's current poems that are in progress. Because I'm trying to get myself away from looking at Facebook before I go to bed. Wow. So poems in progress are here. Stories in progress, are there are different colored uh, sticky notes that are on this wall. I was showing my friend Natalia. I took a, uh, the trifold, like the kinds of kids get for science projects. So I took the trifold, I had my brother paint the outside of it, and on the inside, and I'm hanging this from a utility shelf in my room, I put all of these sticky notes with all these notes for the novel that I'm working on so that I can always open it up and look at it. I also have that at work on my cubicle wall so that it's there too. Um, so wherever I am, I have all of these things that are accessible to me. Um, I also have never really understood people looking for things to write because I think about the 10,000 things I want to write all the time. Um, and one of the things I think we don't talk about enough is, you know, we always talk about writing as being painful. 
And I think, you know, it's such a wonderful thing. I think we're afraid to tell people how much we enjoy it, and we only commiserate about the things that are hard. Um, so I think if you sharpen your, your hunger and your desire to write, you will find the time to do it because you want to do it. You know, and then it's not about discipline. It's about you're giving this to yourself. So for, you know, for me, I'm, you know, my time is crazy, but if I can give myself 45 minutes of writing during my lunch hour at work, that is pure pleasure. So I'm gonna keep on doing that, and it's not discipline, it's, it's a constant gift. You, know, you bring up a, a, the great point of like, how do you find time? And I'm sure that everybody in the room is wondering that as well, because like, um, you know, you, like you say, you have jobs, you have family, you have like, you got to sleep, you got to yeah. eat. I mean, you have all these things that you have to do in your life. And you mentioned, you know, finding ways to avoid social media, fi finding ways mm -hmm. to think about it, even when you're just looking around, taking you know time on your lunch break to write. Doug and Jardine, do you have any other tips or things that you've done? When life gets crazy, like how do you find time to write? Mm -hmm. And you know, Doug, like because you're in academia, right? Like your your time gets crazier and then it slows down over breaks. Like how do you when you when you do get like time when it opens up, how do you like jump into it and you know and, and change like your entire like you know, your your pattern of being? Very awkwardly. Um <laughs> No, I mean, you know, when, when, when the end of the semester rolls around and, and yeah, there's, there's um, you know, this, this gift of free time uh, looking at me, um, I mean, it's exciting. It's, it's a thing that that's where um, I can lose access to the wanting to be there, mm -hmm. to the, you know, um, to be, to feel empowered by the act of sitting down and, and making words happen. And that's where it ramps back up for me. Um, so the uh, the desire is there pretty much immediately, um, but as far does it always translate into okay the day after my grades go in is an eight hour writing day? No, not really. Um, I you know sleep for a couple days and uh, but uh, it is I do have to put thought into how I'm going to do it. Um, I have to say okay. It's in the chair at nine o'clock, or you know nine thirty, depending on what is is going on. Uh, in the chair nine to noon, and that's and then whatever else I get done is uh, you know great. But it, you know I can I can stand up at noon and and walk away and feel just fine about myself. Um, so developing. Developing the ritual, developing the practice, I think, is very, very helpful. Um, one thing that I've learned, or that I learned fairly early on, I think I used to be really, really fussy about when I would be ready to get started. Um, you know, I would need to feel a certain way, the desk would need to be a certain way, <laughs> the, the weather would have, you know, I mean, <laughs> really, kind of, you know, that was a full-time job, just managing that. Um, and, you know, th there's such a, there's a fine line between ritual, which puts you in a good, calm, generative state of mind, and then it can very easily become ritual on which you are dependent um, and become toxic and become the th maybe the very thing that messes you up. Um, so that was one area in which um, I, I learned that the best thing that I can do for myself as a writer is train myself to be flexible um, and to allow things to change. You know, if, if one strategy f for anything, if one strategy that has worked before stops working and starts being counterproductive even, let it go. It's served its purpose. I can find a new thing. Um, so, but I, I, that's, I need to be careful about um, sliding into that, um, th that part of the ritual that isn't as helpful. You know, one of the things that we're trying to figure out when we're first, you know, sitting down with the manuscript, and regardless of whether it's something new or whether it's something that we're picking back up after having let it sit for a while, is, is finding the right voice to tell the story. Because in addition to having infinite possibilities for what can happen until you begin to like, you know, put those like constructions around it, there's also like a lot of different ways that you can tell it. Um, depending on which character is telling the story or, or narrator, but also like sort of the voice and the attitude and the tone. 
Um, how do you begin to narrow that down? How do you, in, the, in those first 30 pages that you're talking about, and you're trying to like find your way to like the beginning of the book, how do you begin to sort of snake your way toward like the tone that's going to carry you through the story? Some of it probably does happen when I'm kind of incubating the project and going through what kinds of perspectives I want. You know, if I'm going to want to use a certain kind of language, could it then be a first person book? Um, so things like that start sort of sorting themselves out as the project um, percolates. Um, but I find tone and voice and the fear of getting them wrong one of the most paralyzing things to starting. I think one of the things that keeps me from diving in sometimes is that I'm going to lock into the wrong tone or the wrong voice and then mislead myself for months on end or pages on end. Um, I've had to really get myself to be more comfortable with the idea that I can alter it down the road. It always seemed like something that was really going to be permanent. Um, so again, going back to play, like treating it a little bit more playfully and a little bit more elastically um, has helped a lot. And I also do a lot of, when I hit a point where I'm trying to figure out something like tone or voice and I'm confused or for some reason what I've written isn't working out, I often write about the writing. I'll just sit there and take notes and say, this is what I'm reading. This is what feels funny. Because a lot of times I can't figure it out by thinking alone. There's something about committing the ideas that I'm having and my reactions to paper that gets me to some revelation that then I can go back into the work and tinker with the, um, the ways I'm using tone and voice to to work. You know, in terms of knowing what you're going to write, Doug, you did, you wrote one book with J.J. Abrams. Um, and I would imagine that the process for writing that book was different than, than the novel Alive in Necropolis, in that you had some sense for what it was going to become. You also had um, sort of the opposite of what we're talking about, like in terms of like not taking the long view. You had a long view because like there was a contract and it was going to become a thing. And a deadline. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the <laughs> publisher wanted their money back. And uh, so how, how did you handle, that's an entirely different way of approaching writing a story. Like, did you take anything from that experience that you apply when you're not working on a novel like that? Or was that its, was its own sort of experience? It, I think it was probably its own experience, but I, I did, I learned pretty quickly, and I'm going to get back to the flexibility thing. I, I kind of, I looked at the time frame. I looked at what needed to be done, how much time we had, um, and then imagined, I mean, at the same time I was, I was still teaching, we had just had a baby. I was like, okay, there's not that much time here. I better be ready to work if I'm in line at the bank, you know, and, and actually just ditch the whole idea of ritual. I'm, I'm gonna just, wherever I am, I can, I can write. Um, and I never did it at the bank, um, but I did pretty much train myself to be able to just sit down and, and forego all of the, um, you know, the preparations for work and just sit down and start messing with words. Um, it's, I would say have, you know, having to take the long view and having to produce a thing for which there were expectations, um, you know, and some of which were commercial, frankly, and, and you know, I had never encountered that as a, as a pressure before. Um, some days it was great. Some days that, I mean, I got my mojo working and, and it was exciting and, and challenging. I'd be like, yeah, I wrote 2,000 words today. I'm that much closer. Um, and then there were some times when, you know, it's three in the morning, it's my third all-nighter of the week, the baby's gonna wake up in two hours and I'm thinking, oh my, what have I done? This is the worst. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a really long-winded way of saying some of it was, was fantastic and, and almost, I, you know, I got to like sublime states of writing and then, uh, and some of the crashes were, were pretty ugly. 
How did you pull yourself out of the crashes? Because crashes are something that all writers encounter at one time or another. Um, and then you have to sort of pick yourself back up. Or are, are there any tricks to you know not letting those crashes become extended sort of slowdowns? Um, my wife is very good at talking me down. Um, and also exercise. If I get my body moving, it kind of quiets the brain a little bit. Um, and yeah, just just being able to step back and reset a little. Um, you know, so it's easier to say than to do sometimes. But but that's what that's what I'm aiming for. That's that's what I have in my bag of tricks. Jardine, you before you wrote your your two sort of literary novels, you wrote. As I mentioned in the bio, um, I think it was four YA novels, mm -hmm. um, and, and part of a series. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine too that that experience was very different than writing um, the two later books. And I wonder. So I, what I would imagine is that there was more plotting, or perhaps like you you learned to appreciate plot and um, outline it in a way that you might not have before. Were there things that you took away from that experience that helped that benefited you when you wrote a different kind of book? Definitely. There was a lot of plotting because they were commercial books, um, and I was collaborating with two writers. Um, and we were also trying to serve the genre, so I was learning how to write in a genre. And I realized, much like I love deadlines, I love when there's rules, like genre rules. Um, at parameters of any sort, when you have to creatively kind of find your way when you're restricted in some fashion is a really good experience. Um, and I'd actually written one literary book and then wrote those books and then wrote another. Um, and the four YA books were sort of accidental. It was a project that was like an iron in the fire. And that aspect of it I can't highly recommend enough uh, same with the creative nonfiction collaboration that I did with a photographer. I've realized that having a few projects going, like two documents open on a page, um, is amazing because not only do you transfer the things that you're learning from one to another, there's just a chemistry between them. And it also is a huge tool in taking pressure off the one holy project. You know, you can kind of spread out your interest, spread out your energy, spread out your expectations. So um, I love I love now trying to set things up so that there are more than one possibility on my desk. When you were outlining those novels and when you when you outline a novel now, um, to what extent do you outline? Because I would imagine that even if you're outlining, you don't want to lose what Irene said was like the mm -hmm. sense that, like there's something to be discovered. Um, what what is your approach to outlining? Like, how much do you plan out? To you know, to what detail do you go into? Less now than I used to. I used to overplot, I think, and over outline, and it was to make up for the fact that I can't naturally plot. Um, if left to my own devices, I'll write about the weather or someone's mood for fifteen pages, um, and I have no problem using very like pulpy or noir architectures for, for outlines. Like I love the idea that a chapter ends with a cliffhanger. Um, I love ransacking, you know, all kinds of websites online that hand over really basic mechanics for a plot. Um, because I love the language part. I love the poetry part. I started as a poet and for me, the most important thing to get from the outside world is a structure to hang things on. So my outlines are not that detailed in terms of um, the people and the settings. They're really about the mechanics of why would somebody keep turning the pages um, and trying to set that up for myself. It makes it easier for me to go forward. Irene, is that similar to your idea of you know of giving yourself sort of parameters? Because as a as a poet too, like you're all you know, like you're obviously interested in language. Do you do you find that when you're working in a novel that you have to um, think more closely or sort of focusly about about plot and about those mechanisms that drive the novel forward? I absolutely refuse to. 
Um, we're going to see how these novels get written because I'm just going to ignore everything I've ever heard about writing them, um, especially the one I've been working on now for off and on while writing other things 10 years. So, of course, now I have a deadline for that one. That's got to be done by June. So we're going to see how, how that works. But um, no, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> When you, so when you're in the when you're in the midst of writing, then because it, so there, that's the that's the idea, right? That there's two kinds of writers. Generally, there's like the pantsers, people who just are sort of sit down and write and see what comes, and plotters, people who sort of outline to start with. Um, and w w so when you're in the moment writing, are you thinking about, are you thinking beyond like the sentence or the scene that you're in, or do you just trust that the that sentence and that scene are going to turn into the next sentence of the next scene. Mostly I'm trusting my narrator to figure out what's going to happen. Well, partially. I sort of know what's going to happen and I sort of don't because I wrote the novel as a short story first. And so now it's about expanding it and growing it and whatever else. But I do trust the narrator to take us wherever we're going to have to go. And Hmm. I'm trying to figure out a short way to say uh, to describe something that that uh, I could go on, you know, describing for a while. But the I'm also playing with the the form of the novel, and so I think because I've decided on a f on a form that doesn't depend on chronology, it's going to give me some freedom to do some more of the um, sort of non-novelist writer things that I want to do. Um, so in effect, in some ways, it's sort of writing poems from somebody else's point of view that aren't poems. Yeah, that's a good way mm -hmm. to describe it. And eventually, I figure out that you know, I figure that I figure um, that it's all going to make sense later on, um, because I know something is driving this, um, and I don't need to know what it is right now. In fact, I'm not sure I'm going to need to know what it is when it's done either. Um, and, and you know, and it sounds. But I mean, I, I really do think sometimes when people have come back to me after reading poetry or short stories, what they get out of it is so different from what I had in mind. Um, not to say that, I mean, because I think my favorite work is the work that I have to meet halfway, you know, when a text is difficult um, and I have to put myself into it or where it leaves me room to enter it. Those are the novels that I end up loving. That's the writing I end up loving. So that's part of what I want to do with my work, is I want to leave enough space in it for other people to enter, bring their own experiences into it, and so that it becomes this place where you know, writer and, and reader meet, not just in, um, in listening and not just in conversation, but in a way the writer and the reader meet in creation. And so I, I really want to leave you know, spaces open um, and so that if things aren't necessarily, you know, this is what happened and this is what happened and, and we all understand the same ending, that's not something I'm invested in. I don't think we have to understand the same ending uh, or that it, all readers have to understand the same, um, the same sense from a work. You know, I think that probably a lot of writers feel, part of what you said was like just trusting that it's going to become a thing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to reach the end, um, that people will find meaning in it. You know, and in part, that's why we sometimes like we'll go back to stories or novels or whatever that we've abandoned. They've mm -hmm. been sitting in our drawers, we couldn't figure them out, and then we're going to go back to them because, despite all evidence on the page, we sense that there is something there. Um, wh when you do that, when you go back to the thing that's been abandoned, like one thing you often find is that, like it doesn't read like you anymore. It, it sounds like somebody else wrote it, um, and you can sometimes you know. That can be surprising in a good way. You're like, oh, that's that's really good. I like that I wrote that. Or it can be like you can feel some dismay. You're like, boy, this really needs some work. It's gonna have to really dig into it. When you tackle a project like that, how do you begin to like sense how much of it you should keep, how much of it you should toss, how much you should like try to reinvent in a different language or in a different tone because you're older and you've got more experience under your under your belt? How do you begin to like rewrite something that had already had a life, maybe abrupted, but a life of its own for a while? I think one one question that, that a thing that seems important is, did I get to the end? You know, had, did, I, did I write one full version of this thing? Um, if I didn't, then I'm not, I'm not gonna worry so much 
about whether I'm going to match the voices or even if the sensibility is going to stay exactly the same because, um, again, I'm going to be revising multiple times and, and I trust in my revision process that that sort of harmonizing of things will happen. Um, and I think because I trust in that process, I'm able to say, yep, that f those first 50 pages sounded different. That's an entirely different, okay, well, here we are in 51. It's going to be different from here on in, and I'll make sense of it when I'm done. But I think, especially for a longer project like a novel, getting to the end is, is the most important thing. Um, I think, you know, going back and trying to make sure that those first 50 pages are updated in your current voice and sensibility, uh, that way lies madness, and that way lies unfinished novels. Uh, you will have a tight 50 pages. They'll be great. You'll be proud of them, and you'll be nowhere closer to finishing the damn thing. Um, and uh, which is actually, I mean, that's a thing that I ran into on the first book quite a bit. The first book took me eight years. Um, it shouldn't have. Um, but uh, I kept going back. I kept making those first 50 really tight. I'm very proud of those first 50. <laughs> um, but um, but I, I had to loosen up. And I had to say, I just, I need to get to the end. And, and it's in getting to the end that you figure out actually what, what is this thing? What is most important? What should it sound like? Um, but if you make those decisions too early, um, you might not get the right decision. Jardine, you're nodding. Um, yeah, I think that um, I wish I could go back and convince myself that just getting to the end was a good idea because I have had a few major projects that just stall out and I believe that if I had just kept writing I would have found what was needed in the first 50 for example to make them real or how I could cut off the first 30 because the story could survive without it but it's funny I think there's a huge um, argument to be made for just writing through it always like pushing forward pushing forward and then there's also an argument for, I have seen benefits from putting something in a drawer, letting it be, and coming back to it a few years later, I'm working on something now that I haven't worked on in eight years, and there's a whole new clarity to it. Um, and then I think a lot of it for me is usually if I stop working on something, it's because I've become afraid of something in it, afraid of failing in some way. And figuring that out, locating whatever that was, is key to continuing. So in, the, in one book that I worked on and I left it for a year, I finally realized that I thought that there was something inauthentic about it, that it wasn't real, that the people weren't real. And I didn't want to identify that because it was frightening to do so. It made me think that I should abandon it. But instead, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be once I put that fear into words. And then I could go back in and do all these exercises and free writes and work on making these characters real. So figuring it out, untangling whatever it is that's tripping you up can be a big part of moving on. Just on a, on a practical level, I mean, I, I, I don't want to come off as, you know, advocating that you, n you don't even look at the old stuff. Um, you just, you know, because I actually, one, one way to get, um, y you know, I've, I've got stories that I've abandoned, I've gone back to, and, my, and the way that I have to get back into them is read through, have a pencil in my hand, and do maybe light edits. Um, I, I'm not going to rewrite sentences, I'm just going to do a little tidying up. Um, you know, not, not so where I get bogged down, but it's all about generating momentum. And then, you know, once I do that for a few pages, I'm in that world again, and then I can carry that momentum forward into the new stuff. It's tempting to get bogged down in fixing things, and you, you sort of have to resist that temptation. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a thing that, that works for me on a practical level. I want to jump in real quickly and just say that I think this also has something to do with how, um, how we understand what revision is. There's actually a book on writing that I picked up here at Book People years and years ago um, by Gail Schur. I want to say it's called One Continuous Mistakes. And there's sort of these, uh, well, One Continuous Mistake. It's sort of these um, sort of Buddhist um, 
incline sort of meditations on writing. And I love something that she said about writing. And she said that, that what you want to do in your work of revising um, is that eventually you want to get to the point where you have the story, the poem, the essay, whatever it is, and that you have burned all remains of yourself out. That you have ashed the things that are you and blown them away. And so that what you leave <coughs> is the story or the poem or the essay. And I think for a lot of people, you, you, you know, people start to think that they are their writing. And it's not. The writing, writing is what you make. It is not what you are. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's, you know, when we talk about crashes sometimes too, it's we identify so, <coughs> so closely with the thing that we, realize that, we, that we don't realize that we are not it. It is not us. It, it is something, again, that we are making. Um, so, yeah, so I think, and, and I think when you look at, at old, you know, pieces of writing that perhaps have been abandoned, you know, sometimes it's we're not the people we need to be yet to write a certain thing. The same way that sometimes you pick up a book and it's not time to read it yet. And then you pick it up a couple years later and it's the perfect book to read at that time. I mean, I think writing happens that way too. There, We're just not ready yet. We want to. And it gives us a reason to, to grow or to develop because we want to be the person that writes that book. We end these panels on, on sort of the same question every time, and that is, like, what are you working on now? What can we look forward to um, coming out from you soon? And I'll start on the other end of the table. Irene, what, what are you working on now? What, what, what are you excited about? So I happily just received news that I have a small grant this year, uh, which is going to let me quit the second job. Um, so now I have to finish the first draft of the novel by June. But I'm also working on a poetry collection, a short story collection, and an idea for another novel. Um, because I also think that you don't finish one project until you're excited about the next one. And so since I'm excited about four of them, this is, this is going to get interesting. Um, <laughs> um, but also, I have no idea what I was going to say next. There was another, oh, the other thing that I've done to try to figure out how to write all of these books in the next few years is that I've put myself on a restriction. So I have decided to not do as many workshops as, workshops as I was doing before, to not go to conferences at my own expense, and to not do several things for a few years. Um, just because I want to try to sort of concentrate my time and energy. And when you start you know, writing all these proposals and wrangling people and whatever else, it, just, it gets to a point where it's a little crazy. So I, you know, it's also about choices. You know, I, I really want to do these next. And so I'm going to figure out a way to do them. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Doug? Right now, I'm working, I'm probably working most on uh, a pilot script uh, for a show that would uh, be like a serial anthology show. Um, and, you know, who knows? N no one's waiting for it. You know, it's, it's not like anyone is, uh, you know, desperate to see it to, you know, t to make it. But I want to do it. It feels like the right medium for it, and I'm having fun. Uh, and once I got you know, a little taste of screenwriting, I, I realized I, I really enjoyed it and did not want to let go. So I'm doing some work there. Um, I have a sabbatical coming up, uh, and that's, and I think I've been holding off on starting the next novel or really, you know, committing to it. Uh, and, uh, and now that that's in sight, I'm, I'm pretty stoked to dive in. Um, and then I'm also allowing myself to write sketches, little, um, uh, you know, if something pops into my head, I might just write like the first page of something and then let it go. Um, a thing I like to do is pick up Best American every year and and write answer stories. Mm. You know, so you know, read one, think about what it makes you think about, and uh, and then respond to it somehow in in fiction. Um, and I, you know, I very rarely finish those, but I think it's a really good exercise. It's fun to be doing those those sketches, and every now and then something, you know, something works. I'm working on a novel slash nonfiction hybrid that actually started 10 years ago, and it is one of those projects that scared me, and I thought it was failing, and about six months ago I picked it back up, and I'm almost finished with it now. Um, and it's based on, I have a ton of letters that my grandfather parents wrote to each other during World War II. He was a Navy captain. She was a nurse. Um, I'm also addicted to screenwriting now. Um, 
I love, again, parameters and rules associated with the script format. Um, so that's really fun, and it's a new territory, like a frontier for me. So it's a steep learning curve and exciting. Um, and I'm also doing these tiny little weird zines with an artist friend in San Francisco. Please give our, our panelists a warm round of applause. Mm -hmm. This has been the Writers League of Texas podcast. For more information about the Writers League of Texas and our many programs and services for writers, visit our website at writersleague.org. Email us at wlt at writersleague.org or give us a call at 512-499-8914. Thank you for listening.